what will uh, be really helpful for the social sector in, in Taiwan is to hear about um, the main ideas that you have developed since the, the COVID. Uh, we have uh, read the at least the executive summary of the innovation after lockdown, of the better together, of the people power, and so on. But I, I think it would really help uh, just hearing from you uh, what, what you think have COVID changed and what uh, COVID have prompted us to think differently um, after the COVID uh, for the social sector. So in some ways, the, the amazing thing about COVID is although it's hit the whole world, uh, it's hit the world in very uneven ways, some with absolutely deep immediate crises, some actually because of early lockdowns and so on, with, with much less disruption. Uh, and so civil society has had to react in very different ways. I think in the, the really badly affected countries like Italy, uh, here in Europe, uh, the UK, uh, France, Spain, civil society moved really very fast to fill in some of the gaps of what government wasn't doing. So in particular, things like uh, food, food supplies, you know, lots of people weren't allowed to go out, particularly vulnerable older people. And in every neighborhood, including where, where I'm sitting here in a small, relatively poor town outside London, for the first time ever, you know, we had neighborhood structures doing food deliveries, visiting older people, making sure they were OK, uh, sometimes helping drive to hospital, etc. There's been a sort of wider shift, which is what I call circles of support, and sometimes using technology to make sure, again, that the more vulnerable people were being looked after, talked to, cared for, sometimes trying to link together family, friends, neighbours on either WhatsApp groups or Facebook or whatever to, again, make sure there was a care which the state couldn't uh, provide. Um, I think that, as I say, that's been mainly in the most acutely affected countries. It's been less of an issue in uh, Denmark or Sweden or, or Germany was doing pretty well. But actually in Germany, the last few days, the numbers have gone right up again. Uh, and German civil society is in some ways remobilizing now what they did five years ago, four or five year, years ago for refugees, which was an extraordinary partnership of foundations uh, civil society and government to welcome a million people into a country. So they, they proved then this capacity to react to a crisis very well. And luckily, it hasn't been so bad in the past, but it, they're, they're now doing uh, the same. We might also talk about some of the, how the, the intersection of these immediate crisis responses with, as it were, the longer term shifts in philanthropy, particularly particularly thinking about the just transition. What is the role of philanthropy in helping us move to a, a net zero uh, economy and society and deal with some of the, the deep inequalities? That's been the big debate. And some people are saying, well, can we use this crisis to accelerate all the things we should have been doing anyway to move towards the just transition? And that's a whole, yeah, a whole whole other strategic question. Right. That's a, uh, I think it's a Winston Churchill quote, and I quote, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, and there really is a sense of like learning from the COVID. And especially now that people are caring about each other much more. I mean, this culture of Instagram vanity just disappears uh, from the like collective psych. Uh, and I think it truly is a good uh, moment to uh, form like circles of support. But circle of support, uh, far as I understand, is it's not a new idea, is it? It's uh, I think the Canadians have used the circle of support and accountability as a kind of social structure for people um, to lead uh, like restorative justice and, and lives and so on uh, since the 90s. Uh, and so what do you think, uh, that was before WhatsApp, by the way. Uh, so what, what do you think have uh, digital uh, changed uh, the nature of these uh, tried and true social innovation organization structures, such as the circle of support, and as you mentioned, the local uh, food supplies uh, and things like that? Uh, how does it differ from the more traditional ways of co-ops or food banks or things like that? Well, in some ways, it isn't very different. It's just a, a more efficient way of, of organizing it. Uh, and um, and to me, some, in some ways, the frustration is certainly in the UK and, and Canada, I know pretty well, is how long it's taken to get the digital industries 
really focused on using their technologies for these often quite simple applications. So, for example, the idea of the circle of support around a vulnerable 83 year old with multiple conditions, or it could be a, you know, a 30 year old with learning disabilities. It's been clear for 15 or 20 years, it's quite easy to use Facebook type technologies to organize the, the, the government services, the professionals, the charities, the neighbors, the friends, the family may be living in a different city to coordinate who's checking in each day, who's making sure there's food, who's maybe helping with the shopping or with you know putting a picture up. You know, this is not complicated, but we couldn't get the companies engaged. And it was also quite hard to fund these projects because governments didn't, they didn't fit the government funding categories. It wasn't classic health care. It wasn't classic residential care in a home. And so there were a lot of pilots, a lot of interesting initiatives, but the big institutions were useless in my view, certainly in the countries I know. And it's only with this crisis that these are now pretty old technologies and very old ideas, as you say, are beginning to be much more energetically supported. So something like a food bank, or for that matter, reorganizing food waste in a town. Again, I think of my town's about 200,000 people. Uh, we have restaurants, we have supermarkets. There's a huge amount of food waste. Organizing that to get to either homeless people who've now been put in, uh, in shelters or the frail elderly, that is a perfect task for digital platforms to do. Uh, it was very hard to do manually. I mean, it was done manually in the past, but this is where you know digital is fantastic. Uh, and particularly with stuff like food, where time is important because you don't want to eat old food or past its sell-by date. So yeah, we're seeing, uh, uh, and a lot of this has been done in a kind of hacking way, pulling together bits of elements of, uh, of open source technology to, to create almost hybrid DIY platforms. And I think that's a very... Uh, exciting development. As I say, I wish it had happened 15 years ago, but hey, <laughs> we catch up eventually. Okay, well, that that's great. I mean, I guess the, the grassroots actually takes root uh, this time uh, in a more fertile ground now that uh, people um, either teleworking or spending some time in lockdowns and so on, uh, it creates kind of necessity to empathize. Uh, and that was what was missing uh, to convince the larger, uh, like more entrepreneurial spirit, but in the industrial innovation, not the social innovation angles, to look at the social innovation angles uh, for real uh, this time. So, so I yeah. completely agree. Yeah. yeah. There's one other thing which is really important. I know you've emphasized a lot in Taiwan, and this is the question of trust. If people feel everyone is pulling together, if they feel there's an honesty, an integrity, a moral purpose, there's a huge willingness to help, to work all hours of the night to fix things. But if there's a perception that um, maybe the government is, is not being honest uh, or that other people are getting away with things or breaking the rules, that trust can evaporate. And we've seen this certainly in Europe uh, a lot in, in recent so in, in the UK, for example, there was a huge sense of public solidarity at the beginning. And then the chief advisor of the prime minister broke, very visibly broke the rules. And almost at a stroke, trust really declined a lot. In Italy, too, where there was a lot of solidarity early on, there's a perception, um, a lot of people have felt they've not been adequately supported, running out of cash, particularly poor people in precarious jobs. And that sort of frayed the willingness to, 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 to abide by the rules. So maintaining solidarity and trust, particularly maybe through the next stages of the crisis, when they've been locked down for months, they're running out of money, they're fed up with being stuck at home with their screaming kids or their spouse, you know, it's, it's uh, the psychological pressure is quite intense. And it's very different responses we see in different communities. And it mainly depends on this, 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 this sense of trust.
Well, m many years ago, I, I used to be in charge of policy when Tony Blair was prime minister here in the UK. And back then, too, trust was a big issue. And we were, we were asked to do a big study on organizations which had lost trust and regained trust and what could be learned from them. And we looked at a lot of history and around the world. There are many examples of institutions losing trust and quite a few of them regaining it. And they nearly always depended on about four things were, were crucial. Uh, and we've seen a bit of this in the pandemic. Uh, one was a sense of moral purpose. You're not likely to be trusted unless there is a sense you have integrity. It's not just enough to be efficient. And often organizations were seen to lose that by being corrupt, self-serving, lying, you name it. Second, you had to actually be good at your job, your core job. You had to be uh, competent. Thirdly, there were crucial moments of apology. When things went wrong, speed of acknowledging what had gone wrong in an open, honest, decent way was crucial then to the rebuilding of trust. If you pretend everything is fantastic, which many governments do, then uh, you know people don't trust you. And finally, we often found changes in the means of communication happening in these moments of uh, rebuilt trust, that um, the agency was learning a new way of engaging with the public, often more uh, more in-depth, not just press releases and top-down talking. And, and I say there were many, many examples of, of rebuilding, but the moral quality of that rebuilding was crucial. And as you say, it had to be earned and re-earned through the details again and again and again. It is not a property which you just sort of can sit on <laughs> uh, like, a, like a big building. Uh, and uh, it, it's a verb, perhaps more than a noun, is one way to think about trust. And so in COVID, We've seen yeah, quite a few different patterns. So uh, again, um, uh, in, in Germany, we've definitely seen rising trust in Angela Merkel and her government, because right through, she's pretty much done all the things I described. There was a, a really clear moral sense. She was very honest. She didn't uh, sort of lie, but they were also competent working with the regional and the public health system at containing the, the crisis. And when there were mistakes, uh, just yesterday, their health minister, Jens Spahn, you know, acknowledged that things were going wrong at the moment. They sort of treated the public like adults, and that's the way you, you build trust. Italy started off by losing it badly, but again there, a prime minister who no one had almost heard of at the beginning of the year, by being honest, competent, quite humble in tone, he's really built up, um, to some people's surprise, trust in national government, whereas Bolsonaro, Trump, Johnson, these kind of populist leaders, it's all talk, it's all kind of bullshit, uh, and their trust ratings have just gone down and down and down. So I hope there are some really good lessons for the rest of the world about some of some very old fashioned ideas about integrity and honesty and uh, treating the people you serve with respect. Well, that, really. That's great. Uh, and I totally agree that a purpose, competence and public apology uh, as a form of humble communication uh, is so important. I, I remember I, I wrote a, a recent feature article, where it is on nesta.org, uh, the UK, uh, that talks about uh, the Minister Chen Shizhong uh, when he received an interpolation from legislator Gao Hong and previously VP of Data Analytics at Foxconn, uh, she cited the OpenStreetMap analysis of the mask availability and said, uh, Mister, you think that it looks like it's a fair distribution, but it's only by distance. If you zoom it out a little bit and take into account the public transportation, the hours people must take uh, toward the pharmacy is actually very much unbalanced. Uh, and Mr. Chen just simply did not defend uh, existing policy and said, legislator teach us. Uh, and, and that is, I think, a moment uh, of true integrity. Uh, and just 24 hours later, we just roll out a new distribution system uh, that will enable people to pick up masks uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, and so that's, I guess, competence. <laughs> but I think this uh, humility in accepting uh, this new analysis is truly very important. Um, so um, moving on a little bit uh, from the uh, trust uh, issue, uh, I would like to, to highlight a, a line uh, in the Better Together uh, report, uh, which is uh, the idea of this multi-party collaborations that are brokered uh, through 
intermediaries and the intermediaries um, ha are to be having a larger role than the traditional third sector, which is kind of like the third in ranking, <laughs> but rather elevating it as kind of on behalf of other social sector organizations for the intermediaries to negotiate in a way that is uh, equal or even better legitimacy than the traditional public private sector partnerships and address, for example, the legitimacy and funding gaps. Uh, would you like to expand a little bit on this uh, topic? Because I'm sure that people in Taiwan especially the MPO sector, are very eager to hear about this kind of uh, cross-sector collaboration initiated by the social sector, not by the public sector. Yeah, so this was very much in my, my mind a few weeks ago because we create a new architecture for cross-sector partnership initiated by civil society. It's called the Academy for Social Innovation, but with government and business working together. And so we use that prompt to look at the many examples, both at city level and national level, of these kind of partnerships and how they could go further. I think in many countries a generation or two ago, they were pretty cosmetic, uh, not very... We, we attempted a, a, a sort of quite an interesting new version of that in the UK two years ago with the previous Prime Minister, Theresa May, who wasn't a very great Prime Minister, but this was not a bad project. And it was beginning to work quite well, focused on mental health at work was one of the issues, uh, transition into jobs and financial inclusion. These were the three topics. And they were topics where um, big companies played a big role, so like mental health at work, in some ways the corporates were more important than the government because they had 30 million people every day they were interacting with, um, and on financial inclusion, the banks. But they agreed to have a whole funding stream for social innovations to back civil society projects and ideas which were re ready to scale up. They agreed to commit the corporates internally to use their own power to address these social problems and working with the government policy makers meant you could find where were there blockages or problems um, that at least was the theory it actually worked quite well in the civil society side the social innovation side okay on the corporate side but our government was completely distracted by brexit at the time so the government bit didn't work but we've tried since then to sort of um uh, uh, detail what this sort of thing could look like. As I say, I think it's a fractal kind of idea of partnership. It could work in a neighborhood, a city, a region, a nation. But the key is a very transparent partnership, which is very clear on the problem to be solved, the contribution of each partner, and there is some pooling of resources in an intermediary organization, which then gains some power and legitimacy because it has money. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but uh, and can then do everything from the very radical innovations to scaling up already proven ones to adjusting the policies of the big institutions. Anyway, that's my hope that this sort of thing becomes much more normal. And uh, I took part about two years ago in Seoul in some very interesting discussions uh, which were being run there where the digital companies were being asked in a much more systematic way um, this was Amazon, IBM, and so on. What can you contribute to the social problems of the city, like apprenticeships, uh, like uh, disability? And at first they responded in very sort of superficial corporate social responsibility ways, but they were sort of pressured to be a bit more systematic, a bit more rigorous, a bit more business-like, and really start getting involved in larger scale programs. And the sort of message was, this needs to be, this is almost the condition of your license to operate in the city. You have to be a citizen as well as a company, and you have to build partnerships with the NGOs, in this case, working on everything from online education to big data academies to all sorts of things. 
so yeah i think this is a, a a really interesting space i don't think there is yet the perfect model and what works in different countries will will vary but I the sidewalk labs uh the the as they are doing the quayside project and it really strikes me that had they started with partnership with the social sector before the public sector the story may end up very differently <laughs> the viewers are aware of I me mean, sidewalk labs was had a very ambitious program in Toronto to create the world's sort of smartest uh, city by the waterfront. They got the backing of the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. They came in with lots of money and lots of hype, but they completely failed to talk to the community. Um, they completely failed to put in a governance structure in which the citizens of the city would have a, a say. And so people just didn't trust what would happen to the, all the data being collected by uh, street lamps and sensors and so on. It was seen as a really a predatory project, not a creative project. Uh, and this became clear within a few weeks and eventually it was closed down in March this year. Uh, and hopefully, you know, Google and Cyborg have learned that lesson. If you want to do something with a community, you have to bring them in and share power with them. You have to make them partners. They won't just be grateful, passive observers of your wonderful technology. Maybe that might have worked a generation ago. It doesn't work now. You have to, again, treat people as adults. Trust them to be partners with you. Right. So, yeah, hopefully they will wise up. Uh, and <laughs> but, but that actually leads to your theory about how to wise up, uh, which I'm, I'm eager to, to hear uh, from you, uh, because you, you, you said, said and, and I quote, uh, to think wisely, we have to learn both to go out and then to come back, uh, to explore other perspectives, but then come back and return to an action or decision that will always be simpler than the thoughts that guide it. Um, and so, and, and I'm not uh, asking you to comment specifically on Google or Sidewalks, but, but what does this um, loop mean uh, to you? Because you, you talk about uh, the ideas of being competent, but also humble, and then go back with the communication that treat other people like adults, and then we go back to the moral purpose, uh, so to speak. Is, is there more uh, to your loop theory uh, of wisdom, and, and how can we as a society wise up? Well, I think this is relevant to philanthropy, and I think philanthropy can be one of the guardians, almost curators of wisdom in a society. The reason I started doing this work on wisdom, which is not completed, I should say, uh, by any means, maybe it never is completed, is I was very struck by the, the lack of wisdom or, e or even the, the corrosion of wisdom, sometimes in political leaderships or corporate leaderships who clearly were not acting wisely by any standards, but also in the digital world, the ways in which Twitter, Facebook, often in their design of operation, was corroding the wisdom of the society, the ability to take a long view, to think ethically, to learn from complex things. And so what I've been looking at is, as you say, what, what, what are the, the loops we could build into everything from how a government department makes a decision or an NGO board or a company. So it is more visibly integrating these different ways of thinking. Um, how do we design meetings so that I, they actually bring out the wisdom of the group, which is so often suppressed? And there are particular methods which I think can make a meeting of 10 people or a thousand people much wiser and others which make them much less wise. I would say 95% of meetings don't actually mobilize the wisdom of the people uh, in the room. How could we even design wisdom into things like search engines? so that they reinforce you know, truth and insight rather than lies and, uh, uh, and hatred and, and, uh, and delusion. And because so many of our institutions are almost trapped in much narrower loops, so like politics is often trapped by these rapid loops of elections and opinion polls and so on, business is often trapped by quarterly you know, stock market reporting, we need a few institutions like philanthropy to be willing to stand back and do as you say, to go right out and take the long view and look at the big picture, look at the, the radical opportunities for a society and then loop back and 
think hard, what does that actually mean for the decisions made now, <laughs> this week by a government, an NGO, uh, a, 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 a business? And I would love to see philanthropy almost own this topic, perhaps working with the universities, which should own it, but universities, sadly, do very little on wisdom nowadays. I'm in a university, so I, I'm afraid I see this at first at first hand. Uh, because I think in this century, we need, we will badly need a lot more wisdom to cope with climate change, it requires transformation of every part of our economy and society, to really handle an, the demographics, an aging population, completely different patterns of care and need. Again, this is a this is a task for which there's no easy answers. We need a lot of wisdom. And then living with AI, the next 30 or 40 years, we're going to be surrounded by incredibly powerful technologies of decision making, facial recognition, da da da. All of these will require institutions with a step change in their own wisdom to make sure we get the benefits without the costs. And who other than philanthropy is well placed to help us help us do that? Right. So maybe the philanthropy is not just the, the love of um, fellow human beings, but also of wisdom, which makes it, I guess, philosophy. <laughs> but anyway. so, um, so just to continue uh, on that uh, tr trend of thought, um, being able to loop back in a longer time frame, that is to say, to think in terms of decades and generations. As you said, that is what uh, philanthropic uh, organizations are almost designed to do. But yet, uh, in things like AI, which I translate as assistive intelligence, by the way, because they need to be value aligned and accountable, just like assistive technologies are, we, we hear very few people from the philanthropic uh, sector uh, demanding uh, that uh, the assistive intelligence need to be truly assistive. We see like protests and um, a few, you know, like sidewalk uh, laps, uh, a few tensions uh, there, uh, but then a more constructive dialogue where um, really the demand is by leading by example, like a wise, large organization sharing the wisdom uh, with the lesser, the less wise, uh, smaller, medium enterprises and governments. Uh, that so far has not quite happened. Uh, I mean, it has happened in uh, a very limited sense. For example, I guess the, the Pope uh, recently <laughs> announced something <laughs> around that, right? Uh, and it's uh, an encyclical. Um, that uh, talks about many of these things. Uh, but uh, that is, of course, uh, leadership right there, and I have uh, the utmost respect for that. Uh, but it seemed more as a exception, uh, not a norm. So what can we do uh, to raise more voices uh, as a philanthropic sector anywhere in the world, really, um, to engage in that? So the Pope is doing extraordinary things. The Laudato Si uh, uh, thing he published, which was an extraordinary intervention on how to shift the economy, and he's working a lot with finance and investment to try and make them better aligned with human needs and human values. But I think there's a there's a missing bit in his account, and I'm doing a little bit of work with with some of his team, um, and uh, at the moment also writing a uh, some work for the European Commission, really on how does social economy and civil society um, interacts with the fourth industrial revolution. Let's call it that. And the truth is, in the last 20 or 30 years, it's had almost no role. It's had very little power in shaping the direction of R&D. It hasn't been able to raise the capital to create the big platforms. So they've all been, you know, commercial, uh, not civil. It hasn't done much to influence the, the operating environment. So I, I, I've been trying to look at what might be a more strategic agenda for the next five or 10 years. And I'd love ideas from Taiwan, because I suspect you're far ahead on this. And I'm looking at, in some ways, some quite obvious things. Um, data is a crucial one. If we don't have defaults of more open data on things like um, carbon emission data or financial data, it's very hard for civil society to play a role. So there's some sort of almost legal preconditions at the, um, the city and the national level. That's number one. Second, capital. We do need to make it easier for social enterprises to scale up 
and to achieve the huge economies of scale, economies of scope, which an Alibaba, Tencent, Amazon, Facebook have. And you do need a lot of money for that. Uh, sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Uh, and so creating a, a difference of capital structure. Influencing the R&D programs. So they're really focused on things like care or, um, or uh, a disability or education or climate change. Most R&D is still focused on the military or is focused on uh, you know, high profit pharmaceuticals. It's completely misaligned with social need at the moment. And then having a much more systematic approach to experiment. So on all the things you know, like job creation again or neighborhood energy, Europe uh, you know, needs to be running thousands of experiments at any one time to find out what works. But again, pooling the data so we can learn in real time as a collective intelligence from those. So those are just a few of the points. And we're trying to get the foundations and NGOs to become a lobby not just for more funding, which they often do lobby for, that's the kind of natural, uh, and they also they lobby for new legal statuses, which is fine. Uh, and for the last 20 years, there's been a big lobby on social investment and impact investment, but it's largely missed out the digital side. And so this huge revolution has been happening sort of over there, as it were, which civil society has had very little influence on. So uh, as I say, we would love ideas from you, <laughs> But I think it needs civil society to sort of take a 20, 30 year view and ask how can it shape the environment it's operating in so it can be a real partner and player, not just a passive observer of the next products from Amazon. Yeah, that's that's very exciting and a, a great invitation uh, to all uh, people in the audience here. Um, yeah, I, I really think that if the civil society and the philanthropics could be truly a, a lobby uh, in the digital era, in the sense of a being an entrance hall. Uh, so even though it may not not be the auditorium, uh, but uh, as we know, going to conferences, uh, all the highlights are in the hallways, in the hallway track. Uh, and so uh, some people call it the, the plural sector for this reason, because that affords the thousands of small experiments to be supported by the goodwill of the society rather than by this quarterly ROI stuff. So, so I totally uh, agree agree with this view. have a lottery fund, but instead of channeling it uh, through a kind of investment initiative on expanding the lobby, so to speak, uh, it's more often just uh, diced out in smaller grants uh, that ask for more immediate, almost like subsidy level um, effects. So what about the tricks and ideas and strategies uh, to convince the people who run the lottery fund uh, to take a more long-term view and to accept more potential experimentations to turn it more into a kind of social investment uh, point of time because uh, here we really need uh, a way to think more long term about the use of such public fundings and we understand that Nesta is the pioneer in this. So do you have something to share with our philanthropic community? Yeah, so I, I, I'm always interested in how you can mobilize new kinds of money and there's often a lot which are a bit invisible. So starting with the lottery, in the mid 90s, the UK created a, a, a national lottery divided the money up to provide funding for lots of things, for arts, uh, community projects, sports, often in quite traditional uh, grant making ways. But at the same time, created Nesta with an endowment, originally about 250 million pounds, so maybe 350 million dollars, and now it's grown to half a billion. And that, that created a freedom to operate in very different ways for Nesta as a venture investor, taking risks, etc. But I think the next step was also interesting, it was in the late 90s, uh, we noticed that there was a sort of pool of was dead money, which was unclaimed bank accounts, bank accounts people had forgotten about. Uh, and we managed to 
pass legislation to turn that into the funding for a wholesale social investment bank, uh, Big Society Capital, which was about a billion pounds, so quite a lot of money, uh, which was then able to fund intermediaries who provided either equity or loan finance for social enterprises, co-ops, mutuals, uh, etc. I was also on the board of that, and that's you know that turned otherwise sort of sleeping money into a, a source of dynamism. Now, since then, it's become clear there's actually quite a few other kinds of sleeping money, uh, insurance products, for example, and and in pensions. So there's been new legislation passed maybe two years ago, also mobilising the insurance money as a new source of funding for social value. Now there will be different patterns in different countries, but all I would urge anyone who's got the means is look around your society, your economy, seek out these hidden pools of money. They will often be hidden because the people who manage them don't want them to be very visible. Uh, but often it's pretty, you know, it's quite hard to argue with the idea of making those useful to solve social problems. Land is another one. Often there'll be underused land, which can be mobilized as an as an asset. So um, I think this is going to be, I hope, a field of creativity. Don't just assume the money has to come from donations and existing endowments. In every society, there's a lot of latent wealth sitting around. That's awesome. Uh, and uh, for the audience, just look around you. You are in the abandoned Air Force headquarters uh, that has been now repurposed into a park, uh, the Sea Lab that we're now having this um, conference. So thank you, Jeff, so much uh, for sharing your wisdom. And we look forward to the questions and your answers uh, from the live audience. And um, live long and prosper. <laughs>